uh, at a moment in time. For example, here, these are data from the cardiovascular health study, which showed that there was an event between these red lines, um, congestive heart failure in brown, um, coronary heart disease, and stroke, and there was a major decline in physical function in association with those events of illness, major catastrophic events. Um, so that disability is very much tied to the disease itself. It can develop chronically, but it also can occur catastrophically. Now, there's also other realities to, to address. One is that into the oldest ages, health disparities persist and are extremely serious. Um, in one real landmark study of uh, inner-city African Americans in um, St. Louis, uh, the prevalence of disability in men and women over 65 was so high that to look at its uh, occurrence, they had to go to middle-aged African Americans in the inner city. And what they found is that even in middle-aged African Americans in the inner city, that 60 percent reported one or more disability already, and that disability was occurring 10 years earlier than in uh, African Americans who lived in the suburbs or whites. Now, there are other changing realities. We've learned a lot, and as Dr. Karaskal was referring to, we know that our health behaviors, what we do, matters in terms of how we age. And in addition to the smoking issue that was already raised, uh, how physically active we remain, how cognitively active, and how socially engaged we remain, all play out in critical ways in terms of both quality of life and health outcomes, and even uh, when we die. These are critically important issues from a public health perspective as well as a clinical perspective. We also have a historic opportunity if you think about changing realities. And, uh, and that is, think about the breathtaking statistic that people are about to be living a third of their lives after retirement. Uh, <laughs> in the front row they're saying, yes. <laughs> Pretty cool. Um, and in fact, how we use our time now has opportunities that we never had before, to the point that gerontologists are describing that we have a whole new age and stage of life that is opening up, which people are calling the third age. The 10 or 20 years after retirement, when people are relatively healthier, able to take care of themselves, able to stay highly engaged, able to have a new stage of life. Uh, and perhaps the fourth age, uh, even in the 80s or 90s or 100s, um, when we see changes with aging, loss of physical uh, abilities and, and independence, which historically we've associated with becoming old in our 50s and 60s. So we have a new stage of life to craft in the main, which is pretty dramatic. And we know that people change over their life course into the latest stages, and psychological development continues over the life course. Um, and there are stages of needs that develop as people get older that you don't see in the same way in younger people. One in particular is the need to really feel like you have made a difference in the world, that you have created things that will live beyond you, to sound really grandiose, that you've left a legacy of some kind. Um, the urge and need and desire to give back is a very critical part of successful aging into the oldest ages for many people. Um, and the opportunity to find productive and meaningful engagement as people age is a, uh, a challenge because we are not organized to permit that for people uh, after retirement in the main. So lots of changing realities, lots of changing needs. And beyond that, we now know that successful aging, if you will, is a multidimensional construct. It involves a compression of morbidity, the avoidance of disease and disability, absolutely. But it must also involve the maintenance of high physical function and sustained engagement in social and productive activities. And it's all three of them which older adults would describe as successful aging, not anyone. 
Uh, there are a number of studies that have been done to try and understand the predictors of successful aging. Um, some of them are the things that happen to us earlier in life, uh, certainly in terms of education, and this is uh, the, the base of Dr. Sweeney's pyramid, very critical. Um, but in red, the, a lot of the functions that we um, know are now malleable and where prevention over the life course will matter tremendously in terms of successful aging uh, later on. Uh, I'll highlight what was said before about mental health and depression, but even our understanding and appreciation of what aging could mean shapes the potential that we have and our optimism about our future. So here's, that's the background. What's the potential for prevention and compression of morbidity? Well, we actually have learned a lot in the last 25 years. 25 years ago, if I had told you, uh, as, um, as was the discussion, that prevention was relevant for older adults, uh, a large proportion of the, pop, of the people listening to that, whether they were health professionals or older adults themselves, would have uh, spurned that per piece of information and said it was not relevant. But we now know, we now know enough to get started. Uh, and we know very dramatically that all forms of prevention matter into the latest stages. What's called primary prevention, preventing the diseases in the first place, matters and works. We know that secondary prevention, or actually a screening to detect early disease and treating it, matters in terms of the course of the disease. And we know that tertiary prevention to minimize the symptoms and consequences of a disease matters too. And we've seen this across many chronic diseases. I don't have HIV AIDS up here. Uh, you all will fill in that blank. But uh, for other chronic diseases that have over, over the last 20 or 30 years been studied in older adults, we know that both prevention and medical treatment make huge differences into the oldest ages in, what's in, in the course of the disease and its consequences. And we know, for example, in the right-hand column that health behaviors like exercise are key players in terms of the prevention and the amelioration of each of those diseases where you see a plus sign. And we know that the impact of prevention has been dramatic. Look, as one example, at the change in the U.S. death rates for heart disease and stroke over 47 years from 1950 to 1997 for the oldest adults that were studied. Look at this. Uh, for heart disease, for people 65 to 74, 75 to 84, and 85 and older, there was a 58 to 31 percent decrease in deaths from heart disease over this 47-year period in the oldest adults. And if you look at stroke, it's even more dramatic, a 76 percent decline in stroke mortality. Data like these, and you can see them for other diseases as well, tell us that these diseases are not inextricably linked to age, uh, and that prevention and treatment and care make huge differences. Um, and uh, in, a, I think, a very important article a little over 10 years ago from Lee Goldman and his colleagues that was in JAMA, they analyzed all the factors that went into uh, causing such a dramatic decline and found that a quarter of it was due to primary prevention of, of the onset of cardiovascular disease in the first place, another uh, almost a third secondary prevention, screening and early detection and intervention on risk factors as well as the disease itself, and a little less than half of the mortality declines were due to improved medical care for patients who developed heart disease and stroke. So all of these approaches matter tremendously. The classic public health approaches of primary and secondary prevention mattered hugely. We even see because of these, we think because of these declines in heart and in um, some of the diseases and their severity, we're seeing early declines in disability rates in the U.S. Um, subtle, but if you project out the import for, uh, for whole populations, actually potentially huge. And again, suggesting that diseases don't have to be turned into disability. 